And good morning, everyone, and welcome on this second uh, Sunday in the season of Lent. Welcome those of you who are gathered here, uh, friends gathering um, remotely. Uh, welcome from home, and it is Communion Sunday, so hope everyone here who wishes to participate today got one of those little kits. Uh, any who desire to share in the table of grace are welcome. Friends at home, gather some elements as we share in, in the Lord's Supper together a little later in the service. Um, I want to welcome Carla Danson from Pathways for Women, one of our valued mission partners, and we'll hear from her uh, in a little bit, so thank you uh, for being here today. It is the second Sunday in the season of Lent. Just a couple of quick announcements related to Lent. There are some uh, little Lenten devotional books at the back table where you get your name tags. Um, those who desired have one. There are some there. One per household would be great. Thanks. And also, um, we are collecting, and there's an insert in your bulletin with a, um, some description and an offering envelope. We collect one great hour of sharing during the season of Lent, and it tells you a little bit about that in the insert. We are going to, at Maplewood Presbyterian Church, we're going to dedicate that offering on Palm Sunday, um, April 2nd. So, but you can give at any time. Give today, give next week, you can give on Easter, if you come back for Easter, uh, but we'll dedicate it on, on April 2nd. And thank you for your generosity in supporting the needs of people in our community and in the world. So this morning, we are uh, having Psalm 103 kind of guide us through our service today, as you'll see both in liturgy and in, in one song in particular. So let's join together in this wonderful call to worship from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. With all my being, I bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. God pardons all wrongdoing and brings healing to the sick. The Lord rescues me from death's pit and crowns me with love and compassion. God satisfies me with good, good all of my life and my strength is renewed like an eagle's. Bless the Lord, O my soul. With all my being, I bless God's holy name. As you are able, let's stand and sing. 749, come, live in the light.
Please join me for the prayer of praise. O oh, bread of heaven, come down. Come down and fill us, for your spirit satisfies like no other. We hunger and thirst for you this morning and long to be nurtured in your love and forgiveness. So we come to this sacred time and place where our hungers are satisfied, as only the bread of life can do. We will wait and listen for your leading in this time of worship. Amen. One of the traditional purposes of the season of Lent is to reflect on our mortality and our dependence on the grace of God and the and gratitude for the gift of life. And so our confession and reflection today uh, is based on that. Hear these words from Psalm 103. As a parent has compassion for their children, so the Lord has compassion for us. For God knows how we were made. Our creator remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Let's join in our prayer of confession and reflection, followed by a moment of silent prayer and reflection. Creator God, out of your love and mercy, you breathed into dust the breath of life, creating us to serve you and our neighbors. In this season of reflection and renewal, restore to us the joy of your salvation and strengthen us to face our mortality, that we may reach with confidence for your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
Friends, hear the good news. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far God removes our sins from us. In Jesus Christ, we are offered mercy and grace. We are forgiven and healed. Be at peace, walk in faith, hope, and love. By God's mercy, we will. Thanks be to God. Let's take a moment, stand, and pass the peace of Christ to one another with words and signs of Christ's peace, again, being respectful of one another's um, sensitivities and, and desire for health. Thank you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. On this beautiful morning. And uh, my name is Bruce Reed. I'm the lay reader for today. Uh, Halleck generally gives me a much longer passage to read, but he's a little concerned about my memory. Uh, <laughs> and I, I was going to warm up the crowd with a joke, but unfortunately it slips my mind. Uh, so, uh, this verse is found uh, on page uh, uh, 1101 in your uh, pew Bible. Or if you're like me and didn't have Arabic numerals when you were young, that would be a, a, a MCI in Roman numerals. <laughs> I'm just a cut up, you know? I'm, I'm really sorry. Anyway, to this passage. It's uh, 
1, 19 through 20. If I can find it. <clears throat> okay, um, so you must understand this, my beloved. <clears throat> Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, a short verse that packs a punch. Well, our series for the season of Lent is the seven deadly sins, yay, um, and which is actually going to be the six deadly sins during Lent and then the seventh one that after Easter. Uh, but here they are again um, in an order which I am accustomed to seeing them. Um, pride, which we talked about last week, wrath um, or anger, envy, lust, gluttony, sloth, and greed. And a reminder here uh, that the seven deadly sins are deadly because they squelch love, not because they will kill us or because God will smite us with a bolt of lightning or something like that. They're deadly to the flow of love into and out of our lives, which is why we're looking at the life-giving virtues alongside of them, which open the flow of love into and out of our lives. Well, today we're talking about wrath or anger. Um, I prefer to use the traditional word wrath because if we say anger, then that may lead us to believe that the feeling of anger is a sin, which it isn't. Uh, anger can actually be a sign that you have a pulse and that, <laughs> and that you care about something. Uh, it's when anger is allowed to fester and linger and turn into something else that causes us to act in unloving ways toward others or toward ourselves that it can be, become deadly. So here's a rich passage from the Apostle Paul, uh, one of the places where the New Testament speaks to this. Ephesians 4, 25 to chapter 5, verse 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give room for the devil. Devil here literally translated means divider, the one who divides. Skipping to verse 29, let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you are marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, one of my favorite pieces of advice about anger comes from Mark Twain. Mark Twain's advice about anger was, when angry, count to ten. When very angry, swear. <laughs> Been helpful from time to time, actually. But to experience anger or to feel it is to be human. Even Jesus got angry. The first thing Jesus does on Palm Sunday after he enters Jerusalem is go into the temple and overturn the money changers' tables and drive them out. He was pretty upset about the corruption that was taking place there in God's name. At one point, he calls the Pharisees whitewashed tombs and hard-hearted hypocrites. Jesus probably was not wearing a t-shirt with a smiley face on it saying, have a nice day, when he said and did those things. He sometimes grumps at his disciples when they don't catch on to what he's showing them and teaching them. And in fact, on one of those occasions, he calls Peter Satan. Jesus meek and mild, right? Not always. So there is a righteous type of anger. But we need to be very careful with that. Because as the cliche goes, anger is just one letter short of danger. <laughs> handling anger is like handling nitroglycerin. It can heal a heart, or it can cause an explosion and damage. 
So because it's such a powerful emotion, Jesus addresses this in his teachings, and so does the Apostle Paul. Quite frequently, actually. Look at all of Paul's lists in his letters. What to stop doing, what to start doing, what to put off, what to put on. This is your old life, this is your new life in Christ, and so forth. In his letter to the Galatians, he says, put away all bitterness, wrath, anger, and slander. In his letter to the Colossians, he says, put away all bitterness, wrath, anger, and slander. In Ephesians, as we heard, he says, put away all bitterness, wrath, anger, and slander. Uh, Paul has a habit of repeating himself. Uh, Either he's forgotten that he's already said it, or he's trying to make a point. And in all of these letters, he reminds us of Jesus' words, quoted from Leviticus of all places, love your neighbor as yourself, because love is the fulfilling of the law. And for good measure, James says, as we heard, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And we hear all these words, and we want to say, okay, okay, I get it. And by the way, it's easy to miss that James calls us beloved. I just want to point that out. That's an important and easy-to-miss salutation, actually, in most of the epistles of the New Testament. The challenges and encouragements we receive come to us as God's beloved. So I love the Bible because it's so realistic and so honest about life and about human nature and human struggle. So this topic of anger is addressed a lot in the Bible because it's a very real human emotion and experience. And it needs to be said that when Jesus or Paul talk about anger, they are not mainly warning about the the moment of anger, you know, the flash of fire, where in an instant we react to something or someone. Uh, They're warning against the deeper burning coals of what has traditionally been called wrath or what we might call resentment. Uh, When anger has morphed into something more than what it began as. Anger often begins as a desire for some wrong to be made right or as a response to an offense we experienced um, that revealed to us a need to protect ourselves or something we love or someone we love even if it's our reaction, say, to someone running a stop sign in front of us or turning in front of us without looking uh, or on purpose. There may be a reaction of anger, and underneath that is actually usually fear, but that reaction is a protective instinct, and that's not a bad thing. It becomes bad when anger, of course, turns into road rage. In that sense, in some situations, anger is an appropriate and actually perhaps even a healthy reaction. Um, I'll come back to this in a moment. So the issue isn't whether we feel anger or not. Of course we will. Notice that James doesn't say, don't be angry. He says, be slow to anger. Paul doesn't say, don't be angry. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, don't let it linger and fester. So the issue isn't whether we feel anger or not. The issue is, what do we do with it? Jesus and Paul seem to suggest that we can choose to do something with it as soon as humanly possible, or we can choose to hold on to it. And if we hold on to it, it becomes unhealthy and harmful to love and to relationships. One of my mentors through books is a man named Parker Palmer who put it this way. He said, anger isn't the problem. The problem is getting hooked on anger, addicted to an emotion that gives you a fleeting high but leaves you feeling worse, all the while robbing you of well-being and creating an insatiable desire for the next hit. Being hooked saps me of energy and harms my health, and ultimately it can block the flow of love into and out of my life. So getting back to Paul's wise words from our Ephesians reading, he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, quoting from Psalm 4, verse 4. Now, some of you may have been told by parents, don't go to bed angry, which is a good rule of thumb and a very literal interpretation of the text. But sometimes that's hard to do, and honestly, it's not always the best thing to do. Sometimes we need to sleep on it and get refreshed and get ourselves calmed down, or we might say something or do something that we regret later. The point is, make an effort to do your best to resolve it soon. Don't put it off. And sometimes that may require talking with a person you're in conflict with. Paul says, speak the truth in love. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, go and be reconciled with your adversary. It's risky, 
but with fear and trembling, we are encouraged to go. This can be hard, and the truth is the other person might not reciprocate, but we're encouraged to go anyway. What I hear them saying is, always be the one to make the first move. Always be the one to make the first move. Direct conversations are always the best conversations, and they're best when they happen as soon as possible. With love, of course. Now, we may need help or advice or some support for having these conversations, and it's always good to seek wise counsel when needed. Yet, we shouldn't avoid doing the good and loving work of building one another up through honest conversation with the goal of mutual edification. So Jesus and Paul encourage us, don't hold on to anger. As you are able and in the right time, and in a process of both self-compassion and compassion for others, work at releasing it. Or, or, work at channeling that anger into something constructive. If witnessing or hearing about an injustice or a wrongdoing angers you, instead of fuming about it, or taking it out on someone nearby just because they happen to be close to you, channel that anger into constructive action. Write a letter to a local leader. Volunteer your time and energy towards something positive. Or write your own prayer of lament and petition, like David does a lot in the Psalms. He lets it all hang out when he's upset and sometimes lets God have it when he sees injustice. Uh, God is not fragile. God can handle our strong emotions, including our anger, and in fact, welcomes our honest expressions. Because, again, sometimes anger is telling us that something's wrong. And we can do something somewhere to make something right. Maybe we can't directly or single-handedly solve the injustice we're upset about, but we can do something to channel our energy towards something good. It can bring help and consolation to others, and it can be therapeutic for us. I mean, we can't single-handedly remove Vladimir Putin from leadership (laughs) or stop the war in Ukraine. But we can stop the war in our head or in our heart and channel our anger at him toward making the world a better place somewhere within our sphere of influence. Or we can bring aid to someone in need. So talk to Carla after the service today (laughs) about how you can help at Pathways for Women. Um, Opportunities abound for us to be a presence of love in the world. In the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, and blessed are the peacemakers. Mercy and peace are our antidotes, or our vaccine, if you will, for protecting our hearts from wrath. Again, sometimes mercy and peace are what we give to ourselves. And more often than not, they're what we ask for from God as we extend mercy and peace to others. I love the reminders in Scripture, and we use Psalm 103 a lot today to remind us that the Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And so when the Apostle Paul says, be imitators of God, that's a good place to start, with mercy and compassion, being slow to anger, and you know, maybe not abounding in steadfast love and mercy. I have a hard time being an imitator of God in that way, I'll be honest. But sometimes, perhaps, we can t- take steps towards being less grumpy. <laughs> Uh, or on holding a grudge, and choosing to love my neighbor as myself in some tangible way. I want to close with a couple of comments. Um, In expressing mercy and grace, there is a grace for us in the fact that we're to do the best we can when it comes to certain situations that are more hurtful than others, where emotions run deep and strong, and with the understanding that not all situations are the same, and not all people are the same. When we we are encouraged to be merciful or to reconcile, for example, we are to make some effort with humility. Not perfectly or in some cookie-cutter sort of way. You know, the Bible never says five easy steps to reconciling or something like that. Because we will each do it in our own unique way, according to the situation at hand, and according to our personality, and according to the time that's needed. There's grace in this, in doing the best that we are able It also needs to be said that there are some who have been deeply wounded by another person in the form of an assault or violence, abuse, or some form of of violence. And the harm that has been experienced and the lingering emotional struggles do not really make it possible 
or sometimes maybe not even safe for them to just go straight to the person who wounded them and say, I forgive you. You know, let's be reconciled. Those situations require special grace and a wider interpretation of biblical principles and maybe extra help from outside sources because mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation may take a long time in those situations. And in, those, in some situations, real reconciliation is not possible. Forgiveness is always possible, even if it takes a while, even if the, another person has died. Forgiveness is always possible. But sometimes reconciliation may not be, or it may take time. But in any situation where people have hurt each other and anger or other strong feelings come into play, we all need to rely on the grace and forgiveness of God through Christ and the strength that God gives us to do this. We need to know God's forgiveness and grace when we make mistakes in anger. We experience his compassion and not his condemnation. Then we need to employ God's forgiveness and grace when we make mistakes in anger. We need to employ his forgiveness and grace when someone comes to us with their confession, if they take steps towards us in seeking mercy, to receive it from them and extend mercy and be reconciled if or when possible. And if we're on the receiving end of a word of truth, if someone speaks the truth in love to us and confronts us with our faults, we need God's grace to help us listen and receive that as well and not say, you know, how dare you, <laughs> or it's your fault anyway. James 1.19, again, applies very well to these situations. Let everyone be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. We need to remember in all things that God and Jesus Christ made the first move toward us in mercy, peace, and reconciliation. Paul says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus practiced what he preached. He didn't wait for us to come crawling to him on hands and knees to apologize and, you know, get ourselves straightened out. He went ahead and gave his life for us before we did anything. He made the first move and always makes the first move toward us in love. And that's what we celebrate in this sacrament this morning. So again, all who wish to participate in the Lord's table today are welcome, and we're going to sing about that now. All who hunger, all who desire God's grace, gather gladly. Let's stand as you are able and sing as we come to the table today. Please be seated. So I love that it says in there, everyone is a welcome guest. Seeker, stranger, all are welcome. So come with whatever you need today. Uh, grace, healing, 
or just to give thanks. Um, Eucharist means thanksgiving, so we give our gratitude and praise to God. And as we do so, as we gather around, let's join together in our celebration of communion liturgy. Uh, there's inserts in the bulletin and on the screen and monitors. Come, all who are loved by God. Christ invites all to trust in him and to dine at his table. Come to receive all the benefits and blessings of his atoning death, his life-giving resurrection, and his ascended lordship. We come to the table not just as individuals, but as a community. By sharing the bread and the cup, Christ makes us one with him and with each other. Just as we are nourished by the food we eat, Christ nourishes us spiritually at this table with the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation. At the Lord's Supper, we look back, remembering the story of our salvation. We look around, seeing that we are together members of the body of Christ. We look forward to the great banquet in God's coming kingdom. And we look within to find our indwelling Lord, who promises to feed us by the Holy Spirit. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Let us give thanks. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. With joy we praise you, gracious Father, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, even when we wandered away from you. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his life, death, and resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Amen. At his supper, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this and do this in remembrance of me. And we're reminded that as often as we eat this bread and share this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Christ until he comes again. So let's take the bread portion, take and eat. Remember and believe that the body of Christ is the bread of heaven for you. Turn the cups over. Now take and drink. Remember and believe that the blood of Christ is the cup of our salvation. Now let's join together in the closing prayer of the communion portion of our service. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your place and glory. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Now let me invite Carla to come forward and to share with us about Pathways for Women. We support Pathways for Women through our Deacons Fund. On the third Sunday of every month, we collect the Deacons offering, and uh, we are privileged to partner with Pathways for Women on the good work that they're doing. So Carla, thanks again for being here. Hello. Thank you for inviting me to speak to your congregation today. My name is Carla Danson, and I am the Community Resource Coordinator for the Snohomish County YWCA um, organization. 
As the Maplewood Presbyterian Church is a longtime supporter of the YWCA and our Pathways Women's Shelter, I want to take a few minutes to tell you about our programs that benefit from your support. I'll start by telling you a little bit about the program and the mission of the YWCA, and then I'll talk about specific programs, including the Pathways Shelter. First, I want to point out that historically, the YWCA and the YMCA are totally separate organizations. The YMCA was started to, by assisting uh, men, and the YWCA was started by assisting women. The YWCA was started in England in 1877, and then moved to the Puget Sound in 1984. Sorry, 1884. <laughs> 18, sorry. sorry, I'm so nervous, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it was started as a way to help the working girl um, to steer women away from questionable activities in the 1800s as they traveled to different locations. Today, the YWCA still works to empower and support women and their families by giving them the tools they need to be self-sufficient. The YWCA USA provides us with our common mission, which is to empower women and to eliminate racism. The YWCA vision, <clears throat> vision is a healthy community transformed by racial and gender equality, where women and girls of color have equal access to opportunity and there's equal service for all people. The main impacts of the YWCA are housing stability, economic advancement, and health and safety. Our programs are centered around these core pillars. In Snohomish County, we have seven sites providing a wealth of services, including our emergency shelter, veteran services, services to individuals who are challenged by substance abuse, parents with AIDS, services to families as they reunite with children in foster care, services for women entering the workforce, permanent housing with supportive services, and parenting classes. Our, our community, our Snohomish County Housing Services span the continuum of housing opportunities from the shelter to permanent affordable housing. And we own and manage 250 units of permanent affordable housing over four apartment complexes in South Snohomish County, 110 units of scattered permanent housing, and our Pathways Shelter. Pathways provides emergency housing to women and family while providing them with support services while they transition into permanent housing. At the shelter, families are assigned to their own room and they receive basic needs such as food and clothing. They also receive case management to help them achieve self-sufficiency. Many of them have been through traumatic experiences and they may have been living in locations such as a tent, their car, or couch surfing. They usually arrive with little to no material possessions for themselves and their children. Our staff equi equips each room with bedding, linens, cleaning supplies, assorted kitchen and household items that the women will take to get started when they move into their own permanent housing. This means that we need to fully restock each of our 13 rooms every 30 to 60 days as families move in and out of the shelter. Volunteers and donors make a tremendous difference at the shelter as the generosity from the community is incredible. In addition to providing financial support, donors bring the items needed to stock these rooms. The women in the shelter are often moved to tears when they see how lovingly the rooms have been made up uh, with these generous donations. We also include little touches like stuffed animals and comfortable blankets to make their room welcoming for them. We have businesses, service clubs, and churches, individual volunteers who do special projects at the shelter, like gardening, deep cleaning, organization of the donation room, and staffing the front office. Since the clients are at the shelter for a short period, locating stable permanent housing is the main priority during this time. Some clients are able to move into YWCA permanent housing, and then others go through the coordinated entry process, which they access by calling 211, and then they're assigned a housing navigator. Um, uh, housing is considered affordable when the cost of housing plus utilities equals no more than 30% of the household income. Recently, I saw some statistics from 2000, which showed that an individual could be self-sufficient at a wage of $13.92 an hour to cover a rental expense of $7.50 a month. That's almost 25 years ago. Today, somebody who makes $20 an hour by paying 30% of their income to housing would be $1,000 a month. The, however, the average rent of a two-bedroom in Snohomish County is around $1,800 a month. 
Many people are paying well over 30% of their income on rent, which leaves very little funds for necessities, let alone having extra funds for emergencies. To wrap up, we're aware of the many reasons for poverty and homelessness. But the fact is, in Puget Sound, the housing costs, costs are raising exponentially faster than salaries, which makes it very tough for low-income families to find and keep affordable housing. The YWCA is one of many agencies working to support families and to help them succeed through our programs. The ongoing support and generosity of Maplewood Presbyterian has been very much appreciated. We wouldn't be able to serve the public at such a high capacity without the support of our community's community partners like your church. So, thank you. And anybody who would like to talk about our programs is welcome to come see me after the service. Thank you, Carla. Please join me in prayer and uh, in the Lord's, saying the Lord's Prayer together. For all the blessings of this life, we give thanks to you, Creator God. For families, friends, colleagues, neighbors, students, and strangers who nurture us that the love of God may grow within. We thank you that your love, like your word, like a seed, may grow to produce in us good fruit. For the leaders of various nations and cities, that they may lead with strong hearts and gentle hands and generous spirits, with compassion and mercy, with wisdom and grace. May they reflect your will, guiding all their actions and decisions. For those who serve in harm's way, those who live in dangerous places, those who live in areas of war and strife, those who live in fear, those who worry about employment, bills, and food, and struggle to find dignity in life, may your grace bring peace and safety to all people, one to another. For those who suffer from any illness or disease of mind, body, or spirit, restore these and all those we carry in our hearts to fullness of health. Health is only you, O God, can bring. May your mercy shower each of us with healing mercy and love. For those facing the end of life, send forth your comforting love. Give solace to those who mourn. Console those who grieve. May your grace surround us like a mantle upon our heads, a shawl around our shoulders, a hand to hold our hand. And as we go from here today, guide our steps and lead us in paths of peace. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught his followers to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Now let's stand and sing that prayer of St. Francis. Make us channels of your peace.
Now receive God's peace, go in peace, and as you go, may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep you, that you might live in faith, abound in hope, and grow in love now and forevermore. And all of God's beloved said, Amen. Amen.